In 1978, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration issued 29 CFR 1910.1025, a comprehensive standard designed to protect workers in general industry from the harmful effects of lead overexposure. This standard, however, did not apply to the construction industry. In 1993, OSHA issued 29 CFR 1926.62, the interim final rule for lead exposure in construction. This standard extends the same protection provided by the general industry standard to workers in the construction industry. The construction and general industry standards are very similar. Most of the differences between the two are a result of the unique nature of some construction work tasks of short durations with the potential for high lead exposure levels. This program will provide information dealing with both lead regulations, paying special attention to the construction industry standard. Lead is a toxic substance. Long-term overexposure to lead can cause serious damage to several body systems. It can even be deadly when absorbed in large amounts. Breathing airborne lead dust and fumes is the most common way that lead enters the body. Lead dust can also be ingested if it comes into contact with the mouth. Once absorbed into the body, lead collects in the bloodstream, bones and other tissues where it will remain for several years. Overexposure to lead can either be long term where small amounts accumulate in the body over time or acute, where large amounts are absorbed in a short period of time. The health effects of long-term overexposure to lead can include damage to your blood, kidneys, nervous system, and reproductive system. Common symptoms of long-term overexposure include a metallic taste in the mouth, loss of appetite, nausea, constipation, headache, and dizziness. Other symptoms include anxiety, insomnia, hyperactivity, excessive tiredness, weakness, and pain or soreness in muscles and joints. The major health effect of acute overexposure, exposure to very large amounts of lead in a short period of time, is encephalopathy. This condition affects the brain and can cause seizures, coma, and even death in a matter of days. Symptoms of acute overexposure include a feeling of dullness, drowsiness, grogginess, poor memory, restlessness, irritability, tremors, convulsions, and vomiting. Workplace exposures to deadly amounts of lead are highly unusual, but not impossible. Because of the harmful effects of lead, OSHA has set a permissible exposure limit, or PEL, of 50 micrograms of lead per cubic meter of air. The PEL is the maximum amount of airborne lead that workers are permitted to be exposed to over an eight-hour day. OSHA has also set an action level of 30 micrograms per cubic meter. The action level, which is lower than the PEL, is the airborne lead concentration at which an employer is required to take action by providing training and taking certain precautionary measures. As a part of the mandatory training program, you will receive instruction in the content of the OSHA lead standard and its appendices, the types of jobs in your workplace that could result in exposure to lead, the health hazards associated with lead exposure, and the contents of the written compliance or exposure control plan used by your employer. Your employer will also make you aware of the engineering and work practice controls used to limit your exposure to lead. The purpose, proper selection, fitting, use, and limitations of respirators. The cleaning practices and facilities you should use to minimize contamination. And the purpose of your company's medical surveillance program and medical protection benefits program. Your employer must provide this information and training prior to any new job assignment involving lead. All training materials and information will be made available to you upon request at any time. OSHA has set procedures for employers to assess the exposure risks to workers and measure the airborne lead concentrations in the workplace. 
Anytime you begin a new operation or task, your employer must determine if you could be exposed to lead at or above the action level. This exposure assessment is usually based on previous air monitoring results or accepted industry standards. If it is determined that you could be exposed to lead at or above the action level, then your employer will conduct what is known as initial air monitoring. Air samples will be collected from your work area over a full eight-hour work shift. These samples will be tested to determine the airborne lead concentration. As we said, in the construction industry, some tasks are very short in duration, with the potential for exposure to high concentrations of airborne lead. Unless properly protected, workers could easily be exposed to damaging lead levels before the results of the air monitoring tests come back from the lab. For this reason, the construction industry standard requires employers to provide workers with protection during this determination period. This comes in the form of protective clothing, respirators, and other personal protective equipment. To assure that the appropriate amount of protection is provided, OSHA has divided all construction tasks into three categories based on their potential airborne lead concentrations. Each category has different respirator requirements. In the first category are tasks in which workers have the potential to be exposed to up to 10 times the permissible exposure limit or PEL. Where lead-based paint is present, these include manual demolition, manual scraping, manual sanding, heat gun applications, and paint removal with power tools that have dust collection systems. Included in the second category are those tasks that have potential for airborne lead concentrations up to 50 times the PEL, such as rivet busting, removing paint with power tools without dust collection systems, moving abrasive blasting enclosures, and cleanup activities. Also included are lead burning and the use of mortar containing lead. The third category contains those tasks where airborne lead concentrations can exceed 50 times the PEL. These include abrasive blasting, welding, cutting, and torch burning. In any of these situations, your employer will provide you with the appropriate personal protective equipment for the work you will be doing. These categories are only meant to be used to determine worker protection while waiting for the results of initial air monitoring. When the results become available, your employer may change the amount of protection accordingly. If the results of initial air monitoring show that the airborne lead concentration is below the action level, 30 micrograms per cubic meter, then the employer does not need to collect air samples again unless there's a change of equipment process or personnel that might affect the airborne lead concentration. If monitoring shows that the airborne lead concentration is at or above the action level, then additional air monitoring is required. This will be conducted at different intervals depending on how high the concentration is. If the results of air monitoring show concentrations below the permissible exposure limit, 50 micrograms per cubic meter, then the use of respirators and other personal protective equipment being used may be discontinued. However, many companies continue to use them for added safety. If the airborne lead concentration is above the permissible exposure limit, then the employer must implement the exposure controls required by the standard to limit worker exposure to below the PEL. Your employer must inform you in writing of the results of the air monitoring of your workplace within five days. If your work area has an airborne lead concentration greater than the PEL, then your employer must include a description of the actions being taken to limit your exposure to below the permissible exposure limit. Both the general industry and construction standards require each employer to establish and implement a written compliance program before beginning any job involving lead. This written exposure control plan must include detailed descriptions of all work activities involving lead, records of air monitoring data, and the compliance methods to be used to limit employee exposure, such as engineering controls, work practice controls, administrative controls, and respiratory protection. 
Employers are required to utilize engineering and work practice controls as a first step in their efforts to reduce the airborne lead concentration to or below the permissible exposure limit. Engineering controls include mechanical ventilation with enclosure or containment systems and local exhaust ventilation systems. Work practice controls include processes like wetting paint before scraping to reduce the amount of lead that becomes airborne. Vacuum cleaners with high efficiency particulate filters, usually called HEPA vacuums, are often used to keep work areas free of excess lead dust. Administrative controls, such as abbreviated shifts or job rotations, are also recommended by OSHA to reduce the number of hours a worker is exposed to lead. According to OSHA, respirators should only be used when other compliance methods are not effective or feasible to reduce employee exposure to below the permissible exposure limit, or when the airborne lead concentration is unknown. As they are the last line of defense, it is important that you use the correct respirator for the job. Check with your supervisor for proper respirator selection. OSHA requires fit testing to ensure that your respirator fits your face properly and will provide you with the necessary protection. If you have not already been trained, your employer will provide instruction on the proper use and maintenance of your respirator, including when and how to change filter cartridges. Remember that the respirator is there for your protection. Use it. The task of preventing lead overexposure isn't finished when you've completed your work for the day. Your work area, your clothing, even your hair may be contaminated with lead dust. Because of this, hygiene facilities and practices are also important in the prevention of lead exposure. As we have discussed, if you will be working in areas where the airborne lead concentration is above the permissible exposure limit, your employer must provide you with protective work clothing and personal protective equipment, such as gloves, hats, goggles, or face shields, whatever is appropriate for your job. Your employer must also provide a clean changing room with separate storage for your street clothes so they won't be contaminated with lead. It may not be feasible to have permanent changing rooms on some construction sites. As an alternative, some companies are beginning to use decontamination chambers, similar to those used in asbestos abatement. When removing contaminated clothing, never shake or blow off excess lead dust. This will spread the dust into the air, causing further lead exposure. Use a HEPA vacuum to remove loose dust before taking off your work clothes. Deposit contaminated clothing in the container provided for cleaning or disposal. See your supervisor for your company's procedures. Employers are also required to provide showering facilities where feasible. If no showers are provided, you must wash your hands and face before leaving work and shower immediately when you get home. If you don't, you will extend your daily exposure to lead and put your family at risk as well. Eating areas must also be kept as free of lead as possible. Never enter these areas wearing your protective clothing unless you've removed surface dust with a vacuum, downdraft booth, or other safe cleaning method. It is extremely important to wash your hands and face before eating, smoking, or applying cosmetics. If you don't, there's a chance you could inadvertently get lead in your mouth and swallow it. Remember, ingesting lead can be very dangerous. Even with your employer using the correct air monitoring and exposure control procedures, you may still experience some degree of lead exposure. For this reason, both the construction and general industry standards require employers to institute a medical surveillance program for workers who could be exposed at or above the action level for more than 30 days a year. As part of this program, blood tests and medical examinations must be provided to employees free of charge. Blood samples are taken to measure your blood lead level, or BLL, and your zinc protoperferin, or ZPP, level. The BLL test is a good indicator of recent exposure to lead, and the ZPP test provides information about probable exposure over the last three or four months. How often blood sampling will be performed is based on the results of your initial blood tests. 
the higher the blood lead level, the greater the frequency of sampling must be. This is important to prevent lead poisoning. Your employer is required to inform you in writing of your blood lead level within five working days of receiving the results of blood testing. Medical examinations are another important part of the surveillance program. These must be conducted by or under the supervision of a licensed physician. The frequency of the medical exams is also based on the results of blood testing. However, your employer must provide you with an examination any time you experience any of the symptoms of lead poisoning. If blood tests show that your blood lead level is too high, at or above 50 micrograms per deciliter, temporary medical removal will be required. Removal means that you are temporarily not permitted to work in areas where the airborne lead concentration is above the action level. Your employer must move you to another area or send you home with pay in accordance with the Medical Removal Protection Benefits Guidelines. The purpose of temporary medical removal is to give your body time to reduce the amount of lead you have absorbed. Blood sampling and medical examinations will continue during the removal period. You will not be permitted to return to your original job until your BLL returns to a safe level. A doctor is permitted to recommend temporary medical removal for reasons other than high blood lead levels. You may have a medical condition, such as anemia, that could make you more susceptible to the effects of lead exposure. Both the general industry and construction standards have provisions for an employee to get a second opinion. See your supervisor about your company's procedures. If you were removed from work because of a doctor's recommendation, then you may not return to your original work position until the doctor gives the okay. An additional medical consideration is that lead absorbed by the body can have negative effects on the reproductive systems of both men and women. OSHA recommends that workers planning to have children maintain a blood lead level below 30 micrograms per deciliter. This is significantly lower than the level that normally requires temporary medical removal. If you have any questions, talk to your supervisor or physician. Both lead standards require employers to provide medical removal protection benefits to employees. This means that if you are removed from work for medical reasons, your employer must maintain your normal earnings, benefits, job status, seniority, and all other employment rights as though you had not been removed. Employers are also required to maintain accurate records of exposure assessment, air monitoring data, blood testing results, medical examinations, and temporary medical removals. These records will be made available upon request to affected employees, former employees, and their designated representatives. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration created these lead exposure standards for the benefit of employers and workers alike. It is important that you take the time to become familiar with the standard for your industry. Discuss with your supervisor or training coordinator how it applies to your company and the work that you do. Always remember that lead is a toxic substance with serious health hazards. Exercise extreme caution when working in situations where lead is present. When you are uncertain about proper safety precautions, ask your supervisor. Remember, there are no stupid questions when it comes to safety.